uh, I'm going to introduce Michaela uh, Springsteen, who's our next presenter. And while she switches on her camera and microphone, I'm going to read her very short bio, uh, which is that uh, she's a social scientist studying quantification and valuation, valuation across human social life. Her work focuses especially on the ways in which numbers create realities, inspired in no small part by the power of the Discworld's narrative. Tivium. And you like difficult to pronounce words. Eh? That's great. I'll just put your uh... name. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah, okay, good. Excellent. Well, hello, I am, as you just heard, Michaela Springsteen. Thank you all for tuning into the conference. I hope you've all been enjoying it as much as I have. It's been great. And thank you, of course, to the conference organizers for putting all this together. Just a quick note that some of my slides have quite a lot of quotes and text on them. If anyone would like a copy, just get in touch with me after the presentation and I'll be happy to send them over. Like James said, I'm a sociologist. I'm interested in how people use and interact with numbers specifically, but science and information more generally. And I'll be talking, as you can see, about science on the disk and what I feel could be an interesting avenue of inquiry for Pratchett studies moving forward. So as we all know, Terry Pratchett is known for the incredible intertextuality of his work. He borrows or steals, as all the greatest artists do, from the greats of the cultural canon. In fact, it is the stories, the, fant the literature, fantasy, folk stories, and histories of our world, of the round world, which quite literally power the disc. Pratchett's use, deconstruction, and reconstruction of these stories have all been the topic of study before. And there's a lot of very interesting work out there which deals with their use on the disc, some of which we've been able to see over the past two days. But one topic which Pratchett drew on quite a bit has been somewhat absent from Pratchett's studies thus far, and that is science. Besides being an accomplished science fiction author, a genre which has both incorporated and inspired scientific advancements, Pratchett was, early in his career, a press officer for a nuclear power station, so he had plenty of experience interacting with professional scientists. And this experience is reflected in his fantasy works as well. In the case of the Discworld, much can and has been said about the Discworld as creation myth. From a doyalist or out of universe perspective, the Discworld clearly draws on the mytheme of the world turtle present in cultures around the globe. But in universe, from a Watsonian perspective, it is explored and understood scientifically. Other phenomena on the disc are similarly explained with references to collective intelligence, time dilation, and even the theorized 11 dimensions of the multiverse scattered throughout the series. The purpose of this paper is to explore what an examination of these themes, this science of the disc, could look like by first taking a look at what science looks like in the context of the disc, then exploring the two primary groups of disc world scientists, and then finally finishing up with a look at why this all might be worthwhile to explore. I will obviously be leaving quite a bit out of this presentation. I think there's a lot of very interesting ground which could be covered in studies of this type. And so my intention is just to show a bit of what's possible in this proposed research agenda. In any case, we start with this question of how do we know when we're looking at science on the disk? Because it's fairly obvious that we can't just look for the application of specific real world scientific theories or principles. On the disk, million to one odds succeed nine times out of 10. The disc world does not run on science. It runs on magic and story. Metaphor has more power on the disc than Newton does. But that doesn't mean that there is no science on the disc. Science is not just an abstract collection of rules and principles. It's the result of a group of people working and studying, interacting, and even fighting over the years as a community. And so it's built up a culture around itself as communities do. And just as Pratchett used the culture of sports fans in Unseen Academicals, Journalists in the Truth, Hollywood in Moving Pictures, he's included references to the culture of science throughout the Discworld series. By looking for these references and how they're used, we can start to get an idea of how Pratchett is leading us to think about science and scientists. In perhaps the most general and easily spotted case, we can look for the scientific disciplines which Prashad explicitly or implicitly names throughout the series. Like the chaotic alchemists practicing a form of protochemistry whose reputation for destruction is reminiscent of the 
image problem, shall we say, faced by some chemists on the round world. Like in the Second World War, the chemists who developed napalm were very much the chaotic foils to the stereotypically technical and esoteric Manhattan Project physicists. There are also the engineers of the clacks or Dick Simnel, each of which is working to build new technologies on the disk and has to contend with the interference of rich outsiders who are attempting to turn their pure technical engineering projects into profit generating machines. Then we have the ologies and there's plenty of ologies on the disk, both real and invented, most notably the twin dark arts of psychology and headology, the most a straightforward explanation of which is something akin to the round world's placebo. But calling out specific disciplines by name is not the only way in which science is referenced on the disc. Many of the references are more subtle or obscure. Someone might not get all of the scientific references, just as someone might not get all of the cultural references. Much of this reference is predicated on the fact that science has its own recognizable form of language. Scientists in a range of fields adopt a specialized terminology, some of which transcends subject matter divisions and some of which is specific to a certain field. Pratchett uses this lexicon to great effect and on the disc I found perhaps no better example of this use of language than in the person of Ponder Stibbins. Ponder's dialogue often explicitly calls on the language and theories of math and physics to describe magical effects. Eleven dimensions, like he cites here, are theorized by some physicists, including Michio Kaku, to be the number of dimensions present in the multiverse. And the structure of Ponder's explanation, both here and elsewhere, his use of notation, would be familiar to anyone who's read a mathematical proof. The language used to describe hex is equally reminiscent of scientific terminology. Besides Hex's many references to computer parts, being full of bugs, having a sheep skull or ram, an aquarium as a screensaver, its use of an anthill and beehives to perform complex calculations echo what we know of collectively intelligent systems and how we build modern artificial intelligence. The Dean and other wizards disdain for Ponder's use of Hex to solve magic problems is also reminiscent of the mathematical community's reaction to the apple hack and proof of the four color theorem, which was the first really important mathematical proof to rely on a computer in a big way. Quite a lot of mathematicians, much like the dean here, really didn't like it and thought that it didn't count as real math if a computer was the one doing it. But of course, there's more to science than language. And beyond the surface culture of science, it is at its core a practice. And for all the disparate disciplines and communities of scientists, there's a unifying underlying principle which they all share. That is the idea that science is, at its core, a way of organizing knowledge according to a set of falsifiable predictions and useful explanations. Science is found in the efforts of someone trying to make sense of the world around them. And we see plenty of attempts at such sense-making, theory-building, on the disk. One of the most commonly cited examples of this in a passage after my own sociological heart is the Captain Samuel Vimes Boots Theory of Socioeconomic Unfairness. This is a, a grand theory in the social scientific tradition and echoes theories and principles discovered by the real world experiences of those in poverty and the scientists who study it. The scientific language of the witches may be more subtle, but they certainly embody the practice of science, like with their second and third thoughts, which are reminiscent of the concept of reflexivity in the anthropological or ethnographic sense. These and other Discworld theories not only sound sciency in terms of naming conventions, but also the logic by which they're defined would feel familiar to many round world scientists. So scientific discipline, scientific language, and scientific modes of thought. We have our primer on what science looks like and sounds like on the disk. And in the second part, I'll explore how Pratchett divides science on the disk into two major schools of practice and thought and what we might learn from that division. To start with, and maybe a shorthand for the entire first part of this presentation, we could just say that to look for science on the disk, you should look for magic because on the disc, magic is the thing most often written and spoken about with sciencey sounding language. It's described and understood with scientific principles and logic, and it's the subject of just about all the disc world equivalents of round world scientific disciplines. And it turns out it even has its own kind of 
particle wave duality in that the thaum is both a measure of the power of magic and uh, the particle of magic. So I'm sure it comes as no surprise that when searching for the major groups of scientists on the disk, we look to the magic users. And throughout the Discworld series, Pratchett constructs a dichotomy of magical practice between the witches and the wizards. Wizards pride themselves on the mastery of formal magical rules, learned and practiced largely within the institution of the Unseen University, while witches work outside of such institutions and work their magic not from books, but from a more practical understanding of the world around them. And it turns out that these two groups also correspond rather neatly with two broad divisions of scientific practice. Wizards represent the group of formal professional scientists working within the institutions of scientific achievement and advancement, while the witches practice a folk science, which is closely tied to the culture and needs of their local community. Now, the idea of a folk science in general is derived from the term folk psychology, and the concept of a folk science can mean different things in different contexts, depending who's using it. But here by folk science, I mean science which is learned and practiced outside of its institutions of governance, which on the round world is predominantly journals, universities, and conferences, and on the disc is pretty much the unseen university. As a result, folk and formal science end up looking and acting somewhat differently to one another, even as they both attempt to do science, that is, to organize knowledge about the world according to a set of predictions and useful explanations. Granny Weatherwax puts it nicely by saying one is like riding an elephant while the other is like riding a horse. I suppose it's up to you to decide which is supposed to be which. But you could also think about it as the difference between a Formula One racing driver and what happens when any of us get behind the wheel of a car. No one could argue the fact that the professional racing driver has a more in-depth technical knowledge of how to make a car go fast. But at the same time, I really don't need to be going 300 kilometers an hour on my commute, and I have a better understanding of local traffic patterns than that driver would. But at the end of the day, we're both just trying to drive a car. But beyond the setting where scientific skills or knowledge are acquired and practiced and the degree of abstraction typically at play in folk or formal science, how is it that Pratchett is leading us to think about the differences between witches and wizards and so folk and formal scientists? Starting with the wizards and formal science, the wizards we all know and love are uh, petty, jealous, and proud creatures who spend just about all their time locked away in an ivory tower, reading books, arguing about the finer points of virtual anthropology and opening doors which maybe should not be opened and which will, once opened, prove impossible to close once more. They're regarded with a kind of benign suspicion and bewilderment by the people around them from whom they live and work at a considerable remove. And they kind of bumble around when they're trying to find the answer to some question or other, though they're most certainly not stupid. Pratchett tells us that a stupid wizard wouldn't last very long at all, though they are perhaps more smart than clever. They're also power hungry and can be dangerous, as the traditional path to advancement by killing off the wizard whose job you wanted will attest. So our takeaway for formal scientists is maybe not looking too good at the moment. They seem to be generally obsessed with power and knowledge and perhaps the best thing you could say is that their work generally doesn't interfere all that much with the lives of the people around them. Although when it does, it has the potential to be lethal. Well, what about the witches? It turns out that to start with, they have some things in common with the wizards. Petty, jealous, and proud could also pretty well describe your average witch. The natural coven size is famously one, as the witches are also very competitive. They're also treated as suspect by their neighbors, though they're the perhaps more obvious respect and fear as well. But unlike wizards, witches do not bumble they are direct and self-assured, or at least maintain an air of self-assurance. And they're certainly very clever and very dangerous to cross. And of course, perhaps the most important thing about being a witch is knowing the right things at the right time and then using that understanding of the world to nudge it in one direction or the other without the use of powerful magics, kind of like the Discworld equivalent of applied behavioral economics. Crucially, the witches are generally cast in a heroic light. They do what's best, what's needed by the people in their charge, while the wizards are depicted as ineffectual, would maybe be the best word most of the time. They're collectors of knowledge who pay little mind to the people around them. 
So should we understand folk science to be better than formal science and folk scientists to be better than formal scientists? Well, as is always the case in life and social science, uh, things are slightly more complicated than all that. The wizards, for all they have their heads in the clouds, do help other characters. People in Ankh Morpork who have questions about magical objects or effects know to go to the Unseen University where wizards will do what they can to try to make things clearer, even if it sometimes has the opposite of that intended effect. And on the other hand, Folk science is a hair's breadth away from superstition, questionable beliefs, and the particularly nasty varieties of blind faith. So in this way, what Pratchett ultimately does is treat with equal seriousness and respect the quote unquote high and low cultures of science, just as he does with other forms of culture. After all, in one of the only big showdowns between witches and wizards in the series, in equal rights, Granny Weatherwax and Arch Chancellor Cutangle appear to be evenly matched and ultimately respect one another and their corresponding types of magic. But there's also the question of what Pratchett could be telling us about science and scientists in general. Looking at the wizards and the witches, people don't understand them. They do a bad job communicating their work. They can be petty, jealous, and proud. They're all looking for answers to the questions they have about the world though, and they're always searching and questioning, sometimes at the expense of other things in their life. There's a reason why Granny Weatherwax and the witches, not the witches, sorry, the wizards um, never have a family. I don't think I need to point out the obvious parallels with the prototypical round world scientist. So perhaps the biggest divide which Pratchett establishes isn't between folk and formal scientists at all, but between people who approach the world scientifically and everyone else. After all, all science begins as folk science, with people curious about the world around them who start looking a little bit closer, examining things logically and writing down the things they see. Finally, I'd like to take a little look at the point of this kind of research in the science on the disc. Pratchett, along with Jack Cohen and Ian Stewart, in the science of disc world, introduce us to the concept of lies to children, which are statements that are false, but which nevertheless lead you towards a better understanding of how things really are. The classic example of which is teaching children that the atom is like the solar system in miniature with well-behaved electrons orbiting around a tidy clump of protons and neutrons when in fact both the atom and the solar system are rather more complicated and interesting than all that. This idea of lies to children is used within the disc world, like in Adora Bell Dearheart's explanation of the cabinet of curiosity or Death's famous quote about fantasy. But I would argue that a lie to children, or perhaps a lie to readers, is also what the whole of the Discworld is about. Lies to children are all about people doing their best to understand the world around them with the best knowledge they have available to them at the moment. And so literature, writing, storytelling, fantasy, is a kind of lie to children as well. It helps us to understand the world and people around us while not being a strictly true depiction of that world. The disc world especially operates this way, constructed as it is around the way things should work rather than how they actually do in our world. That's why we can look at the disc world to try to get, get a better understanding of our world. It's been done with gender, education and belief, and it can be done with science. Through the funhouse mirror of the disc, we can start to ask more interesting questions about the way things really are or how we think they should be. Besides looking at Pratchett's treatment of science generally, future studies could examine what the disc world can tell us about the communication problem faced by scientists, the relationships between scientific and other institutions, and even study the disc world fan community to see how many are formal or folk scientists. My intuition is that there's a good number. To close up this paper, I'd like to go back to my original question. How does Pratchett lead us to think about the practice and culture of science? Well, since science on the disc is magic, maybe we can gain a final bit of insight from these passages from Lords and Ladies, where he writes about the witches and wizards explanation for what magic is. Chance, runes, morphic resonances, potentiality, quantum crystals, you can go back and read the passages like so many in, in the books, they're, they're really excellent. 
But it turns out that the witches and wizards have a hard time agreeing what magic is, even amongst themselves, even though each is working the best they can towards a better understanding of this force which so affects their lives. Pratchett reminds us of the complexities of doing magic and that it's done by people who are eminently human. And so it goes with science on the round world. Science is about coming up with ever more accurate theories about the world while still acknowledging that we're not quite there yet. Like in statistics, where we say all models are wrong, but some models are useful. This would be familiar, perhaps, on the disk where everyone may be right, because that's the thing about quantum. Or perhaps, if you'll allow me a bit of editorial license here, everyone may be wrong, because that's the thing about lies to children. What Pratchett does is remind us that life is about recognizing that reality, continuing to work towards a better understanding of the world anyway, and most importantly, to think more critically about everything. And what could be more scientific than that? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Excellent. Okay, so we have some questions coming in. So, um, um, Oliver asks, Oliver asks Lovecraft infamously claimed that the pursuit of knowledge would only lead to fear or madness, with various sciences often championed through the most cynical Discworld characters. Do you think that Pratchett would agree? It's interesting. Um, as, as I was kind of going through some of the books again and trying to parse out the different um, sciences and how they were used, he seems to treat different ones in different contexts. So I would agree, psychology, um, the only real references to it I found I'd love to hear if, if other people found it, were either the witches saying, oh, we don't, we don't do psychology, we do headology, or veterinary talking about it as a way to manipulate people. So that seems, yeah, to be fairly negative. But on the other hand, um, the engineers, I would say, seem to be almost universally, positively um, portrayed in Pratchett's books. So you've got, um, you know, the, the engineers of the Clacks, for one thing, uh, you know, Dick Simnel, like I said, if they have a flaw, it's that they're too open to allowing people to come in and corrupt their, their pure engineering projects, pure in the sense of pure of heart than, than necessarily pure of, of discipline. Um, but I do think, yeah, depending on the discipline, the different ones seem to be slightly more cynically addressed than others. Yeah, hepology is yeah, it? Hepology is it? Because um, Granny Weatherwax says, like, you don't really need all this kind of fancy stuff. You can just, like, if I wear the hat, then I'm a witch, and everyone just takes me for that. OK. Um, so Rachel says, um, social sciences have always seen some denigration by hard sciences, for example, the natural sciences, such as physics and chemistry, not as real science. One reason is, uh, to quote uh, Targapera, social sciences have overemphasized statistical data analysis, often limiting their logical models to prediction of the direction of effect, oblivious of its quantitative extent. Could your definition of folk science versus formal science be a mirror of this real world debate? How do you think Pratchett would have tackled this debate? <laughs> Just a small question there. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's, it's a very interesting question, and I, I'd, I'd love to discuss this more, and it sounds like you maybe have some, some thoughts about it as well. Um, it, it, it's hard to say. Um, so again, like I said, with the, the engineering versus the psychology in the book, it, it almost seems to a certain extent that Pratchett is falling in line with that a bit, where engineering and maybe the, the harder sciences side of it are, are, are more, you know, physically practical sciences um, are, are portrayed in a much more positive light generally. But I think that if you take it as a whole, um, you know, it, it's easy to point out the scientific language of Ponder Stibbons, right? Because he's very clearly talking like a physicist or a mathematician is talking. And it's a little harder to tell in other contexts 
like um, I mentioned with the witches, with their second and third thoughts and how that's like reflexivity. But I think that in general, if you look at the witches, yeah, perhaps in the divide that he, he has in the book, the, the folk scientists tend to do more social science, the witches, of course, um, while the wizards do more of a hard science, those, those that do science, like ponder. Um, and interestingly, again, although you, you always have the, the overlapping you know, considerations here, because there's also all of the things about gender and education that is being kind of portrayed through the witches and wizards. So it's not just if this is associated with the witches, it must be about folk science. But the, the witches are generally portrayed quite positively, I think. And so um, if, if I think of anything with this kind of divide and um, how Pratchett treats it, I feel like what he does with this is what he does with so many other things, which is that he brings the ivory tower down, right, of, of formal science, where, you know, in, in the real world, that's what we think of as, oh, the hard science is the formal sciences, that's, that's fancy, and we should listen to these people. Because he says, look, these people are human, and they're, they're trying their best, but sometimes they're, you know, a little absurd. And the people who are doing their best from maybe a, a folk science perspective or a social science perspective, um, not to say that the two are equal at all, because, you know, social science is definitely a formal science. Um, he, he, you know, elevates that a bit to, to show the value of that, uh, as even though people might not be able to see it. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I do have a view, actually. I do have a view, actually. I feel like many people working in the social sciences tend to have a kind of imposter syndrome where they, they tend to think that the natural sciences, scientists are looking down on them when actually they're not doing anything of the kind. <laughs> and then they feel the need, you feel the need to kind of emulate the, the practices of a formal science, again, pulling on kind of the culture and, and, and language and everything of that science when, you know, you're looking at different things, you, you have different toolkits that you need to, to look at them. Exactly. We're trying to answer completely different questions most often. Uh, so Tanya asks, what do you make of Pratchett making formal science male and folk science female? It links in very nicely to what you just said. Yeah, um, like I said, I think a little bit of it is hard to hard to completely unpick because it's not as though it's a, a direct one to one where all that the witches represent is, is folk science. But I think it does have a little bit to do with again, your, your stereotypical, prototypical um, idea of what a round world scientist is supposed to look like and act like, right? You know, there's for decades and centuries of you know, human history, there's been this idea that scientists are male and they, you know, work in an ivory tower and this is what they do and, and this is how they act. Um, and, and witches have had to, you know, like, like female scientists, like folk scientists, like social scientists sometimes, um, you have kind of, like you said, there's the question to, to what extent is it actually happening in our world now that the, the idea of, of the scientist has to be male or you know, whether or not it's actually happening or it's something that female scientists may feel, um, I think it does play with that interaction a bit as well. Mm. Yeah, I was, I was just taken back to, um equal rights again uh like the whole premise is that you can't have a female wizard because <laughs> and it's, it's very very similar and the book itself proves there's no reason why you can't yeah. apart from and especially that. later on too in in the tiffany aching series you you end up with a male witch as well so i think ultimately you know he's pointing out this it, this isn't really a separation you can do what it is you'd like to do you know which is what he talks about a lot i feel Okay, excellent. So Joe says, uh, do you feel like, do you feel like what is true of science in Pratchett is true of technology as well? Or does he invoke technology, technological innovation and adopt, adoption in slightly distinctive ways? Sorry, I read that very badly. No, it's, get... it's a very interesting question. And also interesting if you think about it in the context of other fantasy works, right? And, and think about technology or science in the context of other fantasy works. 
you don't really see them so often because magic takes the place of that. You don't need to build a railway if you can just magic your way <laughs> somewhere else. Um, but Pratchett does a very interesting thing by bringing the two together and, in fact, looking at magic through a scientific lens. I mean, I, I'd love to hear if somebody else has another example, but I, I can't think of another example where you have a particle of magic, you know, in, in the thalm um, that can be studied like, like a particle of matter. Um, you know, it's interesting. I think he treats them a little bit differently to one another because, but uh, almost perhaps insofar only as you have applied science versus theoretical science. Because like I said, with engineering, you start to get this blurry boundary. Engineering is a science, but it's attempting to do something different than theoretical physics is. And um, I mean, as we all know, he you know, Terry kind of had a fondness for technology and we, we saw um, his first laptop yesterday that, that Rob showed us, which was very cool. Um, so I think he, he had a bit of a fondness for engineers and so he, he treats that kind of practical application quite positively in the books. Hmm. Okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, okay, Freya says, it tends to feel like there is this culturally assumed and hierarchical clean binary between formal and folk vernacular traditions for things like science and critical theory. I'd be really interested to hear about your perspective on how Pratchett either represents and or breaks down that status quo. Uh, I feel like we covered that a little bit already, but do you want to add anything? A little bit. Um, yeah, it's it's hard to say. It's definitely, obviously, it's not a binary. There's There's all sorts of contexts in between and, and formal scientists hold a lot of folk scientific beliefs and practices as well. Um, yeah, it's, I, I think he, again, as, as with many of these things, he sometimes reinforces it in certain places, I feel usually to make a kind of point, like again in Equal Rights, how you, know, you keep here and you cannot have a female wizard, you cannot have it, and then in other places he breaks it, in, and it, I think it'd be interesting, actually, because I've not, I haven't really considered this that much, but I think it'd be interesting to to examine and do a study of where he's reinforcing and where he's breaking, and and kind of see what you can learn from that. It's a good, very good question. That would be interesting. There's a PhD there. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so M Michael says, is there a particular way Pratchett implements lies to children in his young adult and children's books? Ooh, it's been a little while since I've read the children books. Tiffany Aching, I read a little bit more recently. Um, it's, it's hard to say because when I think of lies to children, because children is right there in the title, you seem to think that, you know, it, it happens a lot more with children. But in my recollection of it all, um, I've always particularly liked Pratchett because he treats everyone, including children, with this idea that, no, you you can figure this out. You know what you're talking about. Like with Tiffany Aching, where um, uh, she's asking somebody for a book about zoology, and they say, oh, that's a big word, isn't it? And she goes, no, condescending. That's, that's a big word. Um, and so I, I think he uses it much the same way that he does in the... Um, the adult books then, I would think. Yeah, it's it's one of the really interesting things about Pratchett's books for children or for young adults is that there's not really a clear divide between them and the ones that are not for young adults or children. It's kind of, if you enjoy it, you enjoy it. Great. Uh, yeah. so, uh, Pratchett has the wizards deliberately not practicing magic as it could be dangerous encouraging the creatures from the dungeon dimensions. Do you think he might have felt the same way about scientists, especially under, especially nuclear physicists? It's interesting um, because, yeah, like, like a lot of times in the books, he seems to be kind of saying, OK, the formal scientists and the big theoretical, like you need to think about what's actually happening, you know, and that's maybe one of the ways where he's looking at um, almost social sciences as more positively like these are doing things that impact people think about how you're impacting people but um, if you listen to some of his speeches or things or there's like in, um, in a slip of the keyboard I actually have here as well there's a speech that he gives at a conference where he's talking about his time as a press officer for the uh, nuclear um, power plant 
and he, he talks about how somebody came into the power plant and set off like the Geiger counter and all of the scientists immediately were like, we have to figure out what's going on because the Geiger counter got set off when he was coming into the facility and you just know that if it goes off again as he leaves, there's going to be questions. And so the way that he talks about it, it's very, um, he speaks very kind of fondly about the the physicists and talks a lot about the care with which they treat their subject matter and their material. So I think it's maybe one of the differences between and and it you know done on purpose within the books that he treats them as kind of silly and and dangerous because even if he might have felt fondness towards them, it is important to remember you know what that kind of science is capable of and that the people who are practicing it should remember that they live in a world full of other people. Mm. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so Matt says, uh, uh, the treatment of scientists in literature is often negative and he's thinking of Frankenstein or stereotyped. Uh, do you think that Terry continues this or breaks the mold? I feel like I'm a broken record here. I feel like a little bit of both because, um, and it depends on which side. So yeah, a lot of times with the scientists, I feel like he's he is kind of playing into the stereotype of, again, a bunch of wizards who live in a university. They don't know what's going on in the city outside them, or you know, if they do, it's only to the extent of like, how much is this gonna impact like our next meal and what's going on um, with, with the money we need to pay for, for the new lounge. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of it's it's done on purpose because I, Pratchett throughout the books, I feel, likes to take people with a greater degree of structural power and kind of, you know, poke fun at them, especially and show like, hang on, you're not you're not so grand. You're not so spectacular. Like, take a deep breath and come come sit down with us and have a cup of tea or something. And I think, you know, the same thing you see with the um, with the wizards where it's. He, you know, they definitely a lot of times have this like, like sense of bumbling buffoons going around, but then every every now and then you you get a sense of what what they're capable of. Super, super. Thank you. I'm just uh, I'm just, I just uh, sent another message saying if you have another question, let me know because we reached the last one just there. Uh, so if not. Um, so, and I didn't, I'll, I'll kind of try and scroll through to see if, if people had said yes to the, um, the, the, if they wanted me to send them the, the presentation or anything, or if you like want to send it again here. Oh yeah, they're good. Um, also, you know, if, if anybody had any other comments or, or questions or suggestions, oh, okay. You're seeing, um, please feel free to get in touch. You know, I'm, I'm liking the, the digital thing is fun because we get people from all over, but you know, I miss being able to sit down and like have a couple with somebody. So I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. So thank you very much. Thanks so much.